um, I already told you about Zoom. Uh, there's going to be a Q&A at the end of the talk between Lisa and Melissa. That Q&A is going to happen over the chat box. There's a little chat icon at the bottom of your screen. So when it's time for Q&A, that chat box will be open. You can just type your questions for both of them there. So we're going to do it that way as opposed to, you know, having people speaking over the microphone, which gets a little hectic on Zoom. Um, also wanted just to let you know we're recording. Uh, which is another reason we ask you just keep your cameras off for tonight. Um, if you've never been to MOFAD or if you have, we have lots of online programs that are happening all the time and the absolute best way to find out about them is to follow our newsletter. So if you just go to mofad.org and connect or, you know, contact us, um, you can sign up there. I'll also send you an email tomorrow reminding you and sending you the link for that. Um, so with that, I want to turn it over to Melissa and Lisa. Melissa, you, you know, may know she has a cookbook, Mosquito Supper Club, which is why we're here celebrating that. She has a restaurant in New Orleans of the same name, Mosquito Supper Club, which is, you know, one of the best meals of my life, truly. I went there for brunch um, when restaurants were, were open last uh, October, and it was just incredible. And we have been excited about this moment ever since then. Um, so Lisa, I'm going to turn it over to you. Maybe you want to intro yourself a little bit and then kick off the conversation with okay. Melissa. And I'll see the rest of you at uh, Q&A in a little bit. Thank you. Sorry. Um, hi, everybody. I'm really very excited to be here. Um, I, you know, it's funny. I, uh, I'm, a, if you don't know who I am, I'm a pastry chef. Um, I used to uh, work uh, basically pastry uh, for Husk, Sean Brock for several years. Um, I've been writing for the last six years and I have a book coming out in August and I'm not very good at the self-promotion, but I'll just go ahead and tell you it's coming out August 4th and it's called Our Lady of Perpetual Hunger. But we're here to talk about Melissa. And I think one of the really interesting things um, that I, I think really appreciate about Melissa is that um, we were kind of talking about this before. We've kind of been on this a very similar uh, trajectory over the last couple of decades, it would seem. And Melissa came into sort of my purview about five years ago because um, I started to sort of see the work she was doing, the food she was putting out in New Orleans. Um, and like you know, two really busy mothers who work full time and who are building their own businesses and creating their own, um, kind of just trying to create their own workable infrastructure so that we could support our families. She sort of popped into my line of sight as a woman who was working in a really similar way. Um, and so, Melissa, I don't know how much everyone knows about your, and I don't, I kind of want to get to some meatier things because I feel like we have a lot of really good stuff to talk about. Um, but I do think it's worth sort of talking about, you know, your uh, stint in uh, high profile kitchens and why you started um, Mosquito Supper Club, which is, I think, one of the finest restaurants in New Orleans right now. So, mm -hmm. um. I started cooking, I think, because I wanted to use my hands. Um, I dabbled in a lot of different careers very early on. Um, and I was involved with the farmer's markets in New Orleans and uh, cooked on the side because when you're a single mom and you're young, you always have multiple jobs. And I, um, when Katrina hit, I lost my job and a couple of my jobs and I decided I would start cooking full time because it was something that I knew how to do. And I also thought that it was something that I was gonna always be able to do in New Orleans. I would always be able to cook um, to support myself and support my kid. Yeah. Um, and then I spent some time away uh, in Napa learning from some um, great chefs and immersing myself and what happens there. And with my kid in tow, um, I always just sort of think back to when I would drop my kid off at um, the babysitter and pay like $50 to have like a babysitter. And then I would go to my shift as a line cook and yeah. I would make like $11 an hour. And then I would like leave like late at night after getting off my shift and go pick my kid up and everyone else was going to have a beer. Um, and that's just kind of how life was. And I would try not to fall asleep on my drive home, you know? And then when I got, I was actually telling my sous chef the other day, like 
when I got back to, you know, work the next day, everybody would tell me about, you know, who they were sleeping with and what they drank and everything. And I'd be like, I don't know, we play Candyland in the morning. You know? <laughs> you know, I packed this for lunch. <laughs> you know, and then, and then you repeat it and then it starts over. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I opened up some restaurants in New Orleans and worked with some really incredible people, but... I really wanted to have my own business so I could spend more time with my child uh, and my family. And I really wanted to sort of throw the industry of what I saw and what I was involved in against the wall and pick up the pieces that I loved about the industry and let the other pieces just stay where they were and try to um, forge a new path, forge a new way. And Mosquito Server Club became sort of like this art project to me. Um, and I was going to tell the story on these tables and I was going to redefine how we paid employees. And I wanted the back of the house to make as much as the front of the house. So sustainable, not only in the food, but also for people to work there. And then also sustainable for me. Um, and as a small business, you know, of course, is it sustainable <laughs> to run a business? <laughs> Probably not because I work all the time and, mm -hmm. and what people don't see when like I leave the restaurant early at night is that uh, they don't see that I, I still come home and I'm probably working and I'm always working and I have to be forced to stop working. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, so I guess that's how I sort of get here in this random environment that we're in right now. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. I, you know, I feel like I, we were both single mothers once upon a time working in this industry and it, I was doing the same dance uh, by the by the point that I was trying to pay daycare and make less than daycare cost I was luckily you know I had a really strong partner and we had a second child and but it was still even with two people bringing in paychecks it was really difficult to make a career out of um, kitchen work which is unfortunate because it's a it's a really important space I think specifically for women um, and it um, you know I can remember saying to um, a friend of mine right before I took the job at Husk I was already really weary and tired and wasn't sure how I could make it work if it wasn't sort of this model like you're talking about where I could potentially have just a little bit of control over the variables. I can remember saying to my friend, I love this work, but I hate this lifestyle. And yeah. I just yeah. wish it didn't have to go hand in hand. Yeah. And I think what I see in your model is this ability to create sort of um, this acknowledgement that your life can be your work and your work can be your life. And that doesn't necessarily have to be this incredibly um, exploitive uh, and dangerous uh, trait to have. Because I think, you know, I think there are just always people out there. I think chefs, one of the best things about cooks and chefs and bakers is that they love finding meaning in their work. Mm -hmm. um, the danger comes in these restaurants and restaurant groups and really high, you know, high rolling uh, uh, investors and uh, business people who think that that's an opportunity to make people work hard for nothing, you know? And so I think, you know, I, I really came to a point uh, with restaurants where I was really concerned um, about well, where I just was really sad about not being able to um, to do that work anymore. And so I, when I look at your model, I get really excited and I know it's much harder, but uh, I also have a lot of respect for the work you're doing um, because let's face it, you'd be working hard no matter what, right? Like yeah, that's- absolutely. And you know, it's like where we are right now, I mean, we've built so much in seven years, but each mm -hmm. step, has been built with intention. It's been built mm -hmm. organically. It's been built with trial and error. Absolutely. I've mm -hmm. learned so much from the people that work with me. I've learned so much from the people who said, I can't do this. Yeah. Um, and so, I mean, last night my it was the last day for my front of the house manager and she's been absolutely incredible, but you know, she really just couldn't handle serving the public anymore in this pandemic, you know? I mean, the public comes in wearing a mask, they sit down, they take a mask off, and all of a sudden we're protecting them and they're not protecting us. And, you know, she's been in the service industry for 10 years. She's an incredible woman. She's actually in nursing school, but 
you know, ever since I had to bring her back because of the PPP, um, she just has not been able to handle it. So she had her last day and we had a hug and a, a good cry about it. And she's going to be incredible in her next place. But, you know, it's been a, it's just been a business that has grown, but very slowly. I have to do it with intention and, and even adding the book, which took about three years from start to finish, um, you know, is another just like step in it and trying to um, pass on the information. Even like put a restaurant, I feel like there has to be something behind it. Any place that I've ever gone to that I've loved, there's like real meaning behind it. And, mm -hmm. and, and that meaning is not money. It's not capital. Um, if I was a capitalist in any way, then, you know, well. <laughs> this would look very different. <laughs> And you um, have, to have some sort of retirement, you know, but that's just yeah. like not the case. I don't think any of us will ever have a retirement. Um, <laughs> and you know, in that vein, you know, pastry was my first love. And when I went to California, I only wanted to do pastry. And, you know, I winded up being a chef because I needed the money, you know, yeah. Yeah. It's you, if you're trying to choose between, oh, we'll give you uh, $28,000 or we'll give you $40,000, then you know, it's kind of a no-brainer. You're like, oh, okay, I know how to cook this bake. Um, you know, it gives you, it gives you like the bandwidth. I mean, it was the same for me. All I wanted to do was pastry, and and then when I realized I couldn't make a sustainable living in restaurants, you know, I was making ten dollars an hour. You know, making you know pastries and desserts, a dessert menu that people were very excited about in Nashville. And I couldn't survive and I couldn't bring my half of the, you know, sort of like the money yeah. cost of living to my family. And so that's when I started my own separate club, which is how we again have like a similarity. And then I expanded sort of to like pickling and all these things and, and learning how to cook meat, even though I was a vegetarian and really expanding my bandwidth so that I could make more money because I knew I could always like you make money cooking food, right? Like, so for people that um, uh, aren't familiar with what's going on specifically in New Orleans, can you just say specifically what your, like what your opening is, what your, what you guys are doing in the restaurant right now? So right on now? March 14th was, I guess, um, the last like real day <laughs> in, in like our life in New Orleans. <laughs> that was the last day we served dinner and then we closed our restaurant. And then we uh, were closed for two weeks and sort of like took a breather and was like, what is happening to the world? And I guess we were glued to internet and trying to figure out what was going on. And then I asked my sous chef, hey, do you want to start cooking for hospitals? So uh, she said yes. And so we cooked for hospitals for about a month. Mm -hmm. And then the funds for that sort of dried up. And so we um, transitioned into to go. So I say we were a deli for a while, and then we were sort of a to-go restaurant. Uh, we were like one weekend just for the fun of it. For my great love of SpongeBob, we were like um, <laughs> we served Krabby Patties and um, <laughs> and pineapples. You know, that's awesome. People, you know, to come down to Bikini Bottoms and eat. Um, and then we decided that we were after we came went into phase two, we decided that we would open the restaurant again and not with the same model, which was a family style restaurant because that wasn't going to work. Mm -hmm. But um, with two seatings, a 530 seating and a 730 seating, and we would do the food plated and not family style. And so that is where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. um, that's been a very emotional journey to get to that place um, where people feel comfortable. Half of the people are okay and half the people are not. Um, and we are going to run and through till next weekend. And then we are going to, um, go on break, uh, give ourselves an emotional break and take care of ourselves. Um, mm -hmm. we are running a little fumes right now and, um, then try to pick back up in the fall when maybe we have a better grasp on it. Um, obviously the cases are rising in the Southern states. So we have to be really careful and we don't want to be part of the, problem so and also the restaurant in general is just running out of cash so we have to just take a pause and then you know mm -hmm. decide uh how to move forward um we're also going into hurricane season too so 
there's that. So mm -hmm. there's, there's mm -hmm. lots of fun things happening right now. Um, but it's been, it's been extremely intense for a small business owner, for any business owner right now to sort of navigate the waters of what's happening and to protect your employees and to help your employees get on unemployment. And to, um, we finally got one of my employees who has a work number onto unemployment yesterday, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, and then to try to peer into the future and figure out what's next, because there's absolutely like no answer to what is next. So, um, Can I ask you just like really plainly, because I haven't, I have a lot of chef friends and I'm, I've asked a lot of them the same question, like how useful was the PPP in actuality? Um, the, the PPP was not that useful in the fact that it forced me to bring people back on in order mm -hmm. to um, uh, meet the requirements to have it. And those people were on unemployment. They had to get off of unemployment. They came back to work in a very stressful situation. They were not emotionally ready. Mm -hmm. um, but then the rules for the PPP changed before um, I was one of the first people to get the PPP. So the rules changed and we had already used all our money. So uh, most people are able to now use their PPP money till the end of December. Our money is already gone. So yes, that it help us be able to try to do to-go food or try to do deli food or whatever. Um, yeah, I guess we got to run that experience experiment with the PPP money, but those things did not um, allow us to be sustainable as a restaurant or um, mm -hmm. make any money to keep us afloat. And I'm not talking about make any money to be able to pay myself or make any money, you know, for uh, capital purposes. I'm talking about just being able to cover our rent or yeah. the general life or our yeah. unemployment insurance, just the very basic things that we have to pay. Uh, we serve a quality, we serve a caliber of food that's very high. We won't make any um, concessions on that. We're going to try to buy the very best possible ingredients to put on your plates. We are supporting a network of fishermen in South Louisiana um, and a network of farmers. And that is the most important thing to us. That's why we tried to go so that we, I could pay my crabber, that I could buy from my shrimper. Um, and so there's not a lot of wiggle room there whenever you're serving a high quality caliber mm -hmm. of food, you know, you have to bring in enough money to be able to keep it going. Plus you're paying people way above what most people in the industry are paying people. And so, um, mm -hmm. you know, we are here now. We really enjoyed being back open, even with a new, um, a new model. Um, but we really just, everybody needs sort of an emotional break. Mm -hmm. um, and now we will sort of see what's on the other side. So, well, so I'm in New Orleans right now and on a, I'm moving my son back right now. He lives in New Orleans and he's been staying with us for the summer and it's a really hard time to be moving your adult child anywhere. Um, you know, this is the hard part of being, uh, you know, just like I do, it's hard. Like you have to let them be adults and you have to encourage them even in the worst of times to try to sort of maneuver but I've been down in New Orleans uh, moving him back in and I'm always kind of paying attention to New Orleans anyway because I feel like it's a second home it's like my second city it's well, most of my best friends live here and uh, we got married here and we our son lives here um, and I feel connected to this place in a lot of ways and I while I've been down here over the last couple of days um, you can see my fancy hotel room in the back um, I, um, by the way, traveling is terrible. If anyone's curious, just don't do it. <laughs> um, Belgard Bakery posted their closing down. They say temporarily, but it sounds very uncertain for them. And that's a, it's a real heartbreak. And we're going to, I believe, continue to keep losing these companies that, you know, like you have had the, the real intentions, the best intentions and the, and the right sort of bottom line to begin with and have worked really, really, really hard to stay dedicated to sustainable livelihoods and really taking care of their people and also serving quality of food and also, you know, supporting farmers, fishermen and the like. Um, and I just want to read because I really think and if and if anybody watching isn't familiar with Belgard Bakery, I would find their um, website and just read this and I haven't had a chance to really touch base with Melissa before this so I hope I'm not springing anything too crazy on you but I think reading just a little bit of this is significant um, because I think it speaks to sort of um, 
what the actual bigger conversation is we're needing to have. Um, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna read just a little bit of it. Um, and then I have a couple of questions for you, Melissa. So basically after he announced um, that he's closing, hopefully just temporarily, he says, uh, the integrity and persistence of Black Lives Matter has made America aware that what we need now is not just a makeover. Our country and our city needs an organ, an organ transplant. We must structurally and systemically transform how we live. I am unsure how long New Orleans can continue to pump blood if it willfully ignores its own heart. The people who can't work from home, the people who make our music, serve our drinks, build our homes, paint our murals, teach our children, bake our bread, the New Orleanians who make New Orleans are at risk of extinction because brutal social and economic policies have made it unbearable to live here. And now we make the, and now to make the brutal more ruthless, the people who build the wealth in the city are being evicted from their homes. And I just, I think, I think a lot of us are having sort of these conversations about what this moment could potentially mean in a large scale kind of way for all of us. And I know that that's more than we can cover in one, yeah. in one I, conversation. You know, I think it's, it's so hard too, because even if you like, you want to touch on like climate change, then you're just right. like, it's so large. I think that what we have to remember is that we're a nation built on exploitation right. and why, how are we at this moment right now where, you know, the, the town that I grew up in is going to be underwater probably in the last 25 years, you know, that like, you know, my dad can't take me to his favorite place as a kid because they're underwater now. Um, like, how do you get to this place where you get to this place because there's been so much exploitation of people, of resources, um, of so many things that it, you're not, it's who can be surprised we're, we're at this moment right now, we're at this moment where we can't even help ourselves and the people that are supposed to be taking care of us in the country and the nation are the same line of people that um, have exploited it since day one. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that you have two very opposite, you know, ends of the coin there and um, small businesses like mine, small businesses like Belgard, the, the small businesses, the places that I want to go to, uh, the places that I dream about in seven in New Orleans, you know, mm -hmm. um, these places are built on so much intention and so much good. And, um, you know, it, and you risk your life, you, you mortgage your life away for these places. Mm -hmm. And then you're in this point right now and you've done everything you can to help with sustainability to try to make people understand how the pieces come together. Um, and then the, you know, or, or am I surprised that the system is failing me? I'm not, I'm not surprised, you know, mm -hmm. because I know what the systems are, are built in. No mm -hmm. matter how much like hard work I, I put into trying to spread the word of South Louisiana or, or what I'm doing, am I, when people think of a Cajun chef in New Orleans, do you think they think of me? No, probably not. They probably think <laughs> of you know, one of the other uh, white men that um, have been synonymous with uh, Cajun culture. And I'm not saying that all those people are bad. I'm just saying that we have a very skewed idea of what's good, of what's built in intention, of what has integrity in this country. Um, and those things that we should support, you know? I mean, I keep thinking about New Orleans, like what is gonna be left, like TGI Fridays, you know? Like what will we, what will we have to um, hold on to? Um, it's, a, it's a really scary thing. And for someone like Grayson, you know, he started in this tiny spot in uh, New Orleans. He stayed in that spot for forever and he just took this huge risk of opening this place that he wanted to share with the community. And I'm sure he's mortgaged to God knows how, you know, and whenever you build a business, you build it on the demographics and what's around you and what you can expect. And yes, we always have the threats of hurricanes here in uh, Louisiana. I mean, my parents' house flooded multiple times when I was growing mm -hmm. up. One of my mom's oldest memory is being carried out of, um, her house by her father holding a pink a purple poodle that my dad had given her you know and so it's like we we always have like the environmental stuff that we're always very well aware of um mm -hmm. in uh, new orleans but you know this is just the rug being pulled out from underneath us i mean 
I told um, Alice in my publicist the other day, I said, I've worked since I'm 15 years old. I have near perfect credit and I may have to file for bankruptcy. And that just seems like just mm -hmm. like a, a joke or then or what do I do? I, I, I'm prostrate to the loans of this business, you know, for the rest of my life because of this moment in history, you know? Um, so it's a, it, you know, it's a very, it's, it's, it's scary. It's mind boggling and it's an emotional roller coaster for everybody. Yeah. And in no way, shape or form, like, do I want to romanticize natural disasters? But there is something about a natural disaster that seems to bring people together in a way that builds a community in a way that this pandemic seems to not be doing for right. some reason. I can't quite put my finger on, um, you know, why we can't pull together on how to just sort of overcome this uh, very huge hurdle that we're all, um, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, I'm certain everyone that's on this um, podcast right now is, it's not a podcast, the Zoom right now is, uh, is, under, is feeling the same way. I just, I, you know, especially as I've traveled through the South, I had to drive my son down here um, and I'm, you know, flying home. It's been really interesting to sort of see the pockets of community when we've stopped for gas or, you know, when I've had to go out for food. I mean, I haven't been to a restaurant and, you know, since March until I got here because, you know, it's either that or eat some peanut butter, you know, in my hotel room. <laughs> but it's, it's just an interesting time. And I, I, you know, I keep holding on to this sliver of hope of this is going to uh, potentially um, retether some things in our community. I'm just, I know. I'm just not sure. I you want to, you want to believe it's a hard restart. You know, but, you really want to yeah. believe it. You know, it's like, I mean, you'll appreciate this. Your husband is a ceramicist, if I'm correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, you know, it like really hit home for me yesterday because I used a lot of Alexander Cunningham's, um, mm -hmm. uh, ceramics in the book. Um, and when I go through it, I was always so happy. And then Alex agreed to, um, make me a set of dishes for the restaurant, which mm -hmm. is a huge financial commitment for me, mm -hmm. um, to get, you know, 36 plates, 36, you know, bowls. I mean, she hand makes every single one mm -hmm. and I put a deposit down forever ago on these dishes and my dishes actually were completed and I picked them up, um, yesterday from the Sunday shop who, um, handled it for me and I unpacked all these dishes, but in the midst of this, when Alex was finishing these dishes for me, and I mean, I'm all about supporting like small purveyors of every kind, everything I can possibly do. My menu is, you know, letterpress everything, but Alex lost her father in the middle of this. And I picked up each one of these bowls and these plates. And I'm like, I know that like her tears are in these dishes, you know, and <laughs> And I usually talk to my guests at Supper Club um, every night and I can't talk to them because I'm wearing a mask and you're screaming, you know? I mean, we're barely communicating in the kitchen itself. You know, people are like, F1. And I'm like, what? You know, <laughs> so it's like really difficult. But so I've been writing letters and giving people letters and poems to read when they get to the restaurant. And this is like something I wanted to add to the letter. Like there, the like pain in these plates and these dishes and like mm -hmm. the beauty in them and life and the whole thing. Like, I don't, I don't know if people understand like how intense it is, you know, unless mm -hmm. it has um, sort of like affected you. Um, well, and how much I, sacrifice I think it's all connected. It is know? all, and how much sacrifice, like so much sacrifice, like across the board being made to just continuing to support each other. Like that's a, you know, I mean, Sean, uh, John, my husband is making all of the tableware for Sean's new restaurant and it's a hefty order. And I am certain it would have been really easy for him in March to say, we can't do it anymore. Yeah. He didn't. And we've been able to survive, you know, <laughs> for the last, it was like, the last yeah. four months because and John is just working his you know his ass off back in our backyard which is where his studio is to produce this and you know and in the same way it has not been easy for him he cannot concentrate he's very worried about our immediate family and friends and all of the things that are happening and all the while he's creating this product that's going to you know go to a place and hold food that hopefully gets to be made you know 
Um, yeah. So it's an, it's an incredible time. And, um, I, you know, I, I just, I really value where your commitments are. And I just, I'm glad I have a public opportunity to say that because I, I think so often it gets sort of lost in the shuffle when people are working really hard to keep to the right um, pace, you know, to keep to the right commitment. And, um, and it shouldn't you don't be- have to do it all in the beginning. Like I certainly was at World Market in the beginning and I was buying plates and I was hating them, but I had to buy these plates, you know, or I was using stuff from thrift stores. Yeah. You know, but then whenever you get to a place and you feel really good about it, then you yeah. can like, you know, put your money where your mouth is. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, okay, we've got just about 10 minutes before Q&A starts, which is a significant amount of time, but I feel like you and I could talk about everything for a long time. So I, I do want to talk about, since we're kind of on community, I want to segue into um, your specific community and the Cajun community. And like, I, you know, and this book is beautiful. If you haven't bought the book, please by the book. I mean, it's visually, it's beautifully, it's really beautifully written. And I really, Melissa, I really hope you write more. I really think, yeah, so too. I really think that the writing is not, I mean, it is, I, I'm certain that the recipes are outstanding. I haven't cooked a single one yet, but the writing is just so stunning and so wonderful. Um, and I'm just, I, I think that that's such an amazing gift to have. Um, and I feel like a lot of cooks are good writers and I don't know what that connection is. But anyway, I really just enjoyed your writing. Um, and I really especially enjoyed reading about your hometown and a reading about how you grew up. And also, and I think what I would love is if we can talk about that and talk about the industry of your hometown too, because I feel like that's a really significant part of your story. Um, and it's a part of your story that I didn't, I didn't really know anything about. I, I knew, I knew, you know, I knew about the, the coast and I knew about, you know, the oil industry and I knew about the shrimping industry and I knew how all of these things were sort of getting really, uh, hard pressed to work together and, and for certain parts of it to survive. Um, and I just, uh, I, I, I think what I'm really curious about is sort of this real deep sense of community that the fishermen and the shrimpers have um, and how you grew up in that. Um, so I grew up in Chauvin, Louisiana, um, and it's an hour and a half southwest of New Orleans. It's a tiny fishing village right on the Gulf of Mexico. So a lot of people don't understand what a bayou is, and it's just sort of a meandering strip of water. It was probably a former tributary of the Mississippi River at some point, and um, usually they all uh, flood into larger bodies of water, lakes, in the case of Bayou Petit Caillou, where I grew up, it, it dead ends in the Gulf of Mexico. So if we put the canoe or kayak or pirou again by my mom's house, when we get to the end, it's the Gulf of Mexico. Mm -hmm. But is it the Gulf of Mexico? No, it's, a, it's not called the Gulf of Mexico. It's like Lake Barry or Lake Boudreau or whatever. But the fact of the matter is that we've lost so much uh, barrier waters and islands and everything that it is the Gulf of Mexico. Um, so it's one uh, waterway that goes all the way down and houses are sort of built on both sides of it on Highway 56. And along that waterway is a, a fishing industry, uh, crabbing, oysters, shrimping, everyone sort of has a house and they have a boat, you know? And um, that was sort of the only industry and besides building until the oil industry sort of came in. And so now it's this weird, um, handshake of uh, oil and shrimp. And the best way I can describe that is that in Morgan City, there's a shrimp and petroleum festival and there's a shrimp and petroleum queen of the festival. Mm -hmm. So uh, you can just look that up and dig deep into it. <laughs> but, um, you know, it was very patriarchal when I grew up and when my parents grew up and sort of the men fished and uh, brought in the catch and the women cooked the catch. And then the men tended to nets and tended to their boats and the women tended to uh, domestic duty. And so um, growing up, I always felt like I needed a passport to be outside, you know, and even now when I'm out in the swamp, you know, with certain people, you know, it's like, I still feel like that. It's like, as a woman, like, oh, here, here you get to enjoy our swamp, you know, like it's not mine too. Um, but it is a very tight-knit community that's just sort of steeped in culture and traditions. And 
what um, strikes me, um, which is so amazing, and I felt this when I've been like in Italy and you know in different places in Europe, is that in these little tiny communities, the food stays the same. You know, so it's like my mom is cooking the same food that she's been cooking for her whole life. You know, like she doesn't like really get creative and neither did her mom, you know, and before, I mean, I think the big thing that my grandmother did was introduce garlic into some of the dishes. Um, but my grandma can always, re can also remember the first time she saw like a banana, you know? So, um, so because they were so sort of cut off and because they just kept cooking the same food that it's sort of this tradition and these cultures have been preserved. Um, and I think that, um, that I can, I, you know, I mean, th certainly things have changed on the bayou, but the, the families are still taking care of each other by feeding each other and by providing food. And I guess one of the best ways I can describe it is I went home way before COVID. I went home, I was going, I would pick up my oysters in um, where I'm from every week for the restaurant. And um, because we're having a huge oyster problem here in New Orleans because Mississippi River has been high. So they've been opening the Bonnie Carey Spillway and flooding out all the oyster beds in the east. And so the oysters are all dead. So yeah. the people that I used to buy my oysters from, I can't buy them from. So I've been driving down to my hometown and getting them from uh, people I've been knowing since I'm you know, growing up. And I think one of the best ways to describe it is that I was um, in, I, was, I drove into my mom's house and then I got out and uh, she was like, are you hungry? And I was like, yeah. And so she's like, well, I'm gonna make you a pancake. And I was like, okay, great. And then while I'm making a pancake, while she's making me a pancake, she's like, oh, what do you want for lunch? And I'm like, I don't know. And she's like, well, we have, we can have white beans or red beans and we're gonna have fried fish because there was a bowl, a metal bowl with ice of freshly filleted fish in it. And meanwhile, my dad is fishing. Um, and so she starts putting on a pot of beans and, mm -hmm. um, you know, by lunchtime, we're eating beans and we're eating the fish that my dad caught. And then my uh, aunt comes into the house and she has brought, uh, um, oh, she comes in for fish. So she gets some fish for herself out the fridge and then she leaves. And about an hour or so later, she comes back with a crock pot of ducks and she puts it on the <laughs> counter and she plugs it in like without saying anything. <laughs> Here's some ducks that we killed. She plugs it in. This is for Chucky when he comes back from fishing. Um, you know, and then my dad. I want to say I've never been anywhere where someone's just walked in with a bunch yeah. of ducks. <laughs> yeah, a crock pot plugs it in, you know, and then my dad comes back with a whole bunch of fish. He fillets it. Every, you know, my mom lives next to all her sisters. So, um, and a couple, one just recently passed away, but, you know, she lives next to my Aunt Arlene, my Aunt Christine, my Aunt Linda, my Aunt Brenda. And then people just like meander into the house, say a couple of words, grab fish out the fridge, and then, you know, leave. And, and then even before I left, my um, Uncle Garden had come in no shirt, no shoes with a pot of um, crabs that he had cooked for my dad. Because he was like, your dad said he wanted crabs. And, you know, those crabs, you know, he got from a fisherman from, my, um, from his daughter and uh, son-in-law. So it's like food is so central to everything that's happening at all times. You know, putting away food, procuring food, cooking food sharing food, that is the way I grew up. And, and then I'm on the great receiving end of that, that they, it stayed the same. Yeah. And that is a really great thing. Um, like you, I'm not very good at, um, you know, uh, self-promotion or anything. The things that I do at the restaurant are subtle, they're simple. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to be on the Food Network, you know, and what we did with the book was to try to show what I loved about the culture that was subtle and simple. And we tried to make really subtle things that maybe people would notice and maybe people don't. And I thought about this picture today, which is a beautiful um, oak tree on Bayou Petit Caillou, but it probably is going to take a trained eye to realize that that oak tree is a goner, you know, mm -hmm. this oak tree is in this bayou this bayou is receiving salt water and that's why the oak trees in the bayou. And that's sort of what you see when you go down to Chauvin, you know, you see these things that you would look at and be like, holy shit, that's beautiful. Yeah. But then also you're like, oh, wait a second, that's really sad. That's a beautiful live oak and it's being sort of engulfed. And, you know, and, and in a way you can look at what's happening in the world right now and to small businesses and, you know, to these things with integrity, we're being sort of pummeled 
by, um, you know, big business and capitalism. And, and like I said before, I mean, you, this is not something I'm surprised by because we're a, a nation built on it, unfortunately. You know, it makes me wonder, you know, like I, I feel like I have a read on, you know, how this affects people in our stratosphere. But like, tell me about like, what is this doing to your family, you know, and to tell I, me about I would say that pretty much like my nanny who lives across the street from me, she is battling cancer. So we kind of have her in a bubble, you know, mm -hmm. uh, put you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg in that bubble, please. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, you know, not a lot has changed for them. Uh, for Christmas, I bought my mom a five gallon bucket of raw sugar that I get from uh, one of my sugar guys. And they ran out of sugar at the Piggly Wiggly. But my mom assured everyone that she <laughs> had sugar. And if they drove to her house, she would she you them. Know, put them some in a Ziploc bag and give them some. <laughs> My dad is still fishing every day. They're still eating the same food. I guess the worst thing is that I can't go visit and yeah. they can't go vi come visit, you know? So, mm -hmm. you know, my mom keeps saying at some point we're gonna have to um, start living our lives again. And, you know, she says, I'm, I'm not going the rest of my life without seeing my kids, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, they closed the churches down for a while, which was a good thing, but now they're back open. But they're taking it very seriously. You know, an electrician tried to come to my house the other day and he didn't want to wear a mask. And so, and he wanted to, he said he had divine protection and he wanted to have a spiritual conversation about it. And I told him, I said, look, a star. So my mom goes to church every single day and she's wearing a mask, you know, so I'm not going to have that conversation with you. <laughs> um, but I think that because they're in sort of that little bubble yeah. down there and they are, such like a tight knit community that I think that they're trying the best that they can to uh, protect themselves. But you can't stop my dad from fishing. You know, it's he he just won't. And I think for my mother, I think she's happy to get him out the house. Yeah, <laughs> I bet she is. You go fishing with your dad. So you say you like. I know we got to go to Q and A in just a second, but I want to ask you because you said something about the the swamp and the bayou. You needing a passport, but some of the most beautiful pictures in the book were of you fishing with your dad. So do you oh, do yeah. a lot? Yeah, I mean, as much as I possibly can. I mean, sometimes I'm literally driving in New Orleans, and I'll text him or I'll call him, and he'll be like, "They're biting," and I will leave what I'm doing, and I will drive down a cocodri, and he'll drive the boat to where, you know, where I park the car and I'll jump in. And then I just spend like four hours with them. I, you know, I go back to my mom's house and eat whatever jambalaya or fried shrimp. And then I, and then I drive back to the city and, and sometimes that fish lands on the supper club table, you know, and, um, you know, those are the, you know, best times for me. I love being on the water. I, I need it to, feel okay. I'll never be able to live in a landlocked place. You know, I have to be near the water. Um, and, and you know, the thing is, is that growing up, my dad worked four jobs. We never got to do anything together. So after my dad retired, he was sort of forced into retirement at 70. Um, he, now this is us actually getting to spend time with him and getting to learn from him. And, you know, he's the storyteller in the family. So, so much information in the book is directly from him. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm very fortunate that he's still around and I get to do these things with him. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. What do you guys usually catch? Redfish and trout. He's very gros which is the Cajun word for fancy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he prefers to just keep the redfish and trout. <laughs> to throw back the other stuff, which is kind of ridiculous. But, you know, I play by his rules when I'm with him. Tell me what that word is again. Good old sham. All right. I like that word. All right. So we got our, I think we're, we're ready for Q&A. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What an amazing conversation. Thank you both so much. This really, I wish we could keep listening to you all night long. Um, <laughs> we will definitely have to do that switch when your book comes out. <laughs> this is a really incredible, just this, com this combination of these two amazing women. Wow. Um, um, okay, so first question I have from Armistead asks, um, where do you source your food and how do you set your menu, Melissa? Um, well, when the farmer's markets were open, we pretty much were like, um, I always would go to the Tuesday farmer's market 
and figure out what they had. And that would sort of round out what vegetables or salads I was going to serve. Um, for a long time, I only got shrimp from my cousin, but then I grew a little bit too much. So I had to expand. So I have a couple of different shrimpers I use. Uh, Lance Nacio is uh, a huge supplier for me. I use the same um, uh, crab family, a uh, co-op of uh, crabbers. Uh, the Higgins and Lafitte, Louisiana. So every day you find somebody new to use or you find a way to sort of tighten the net, you know, of um, being able to like support a community around you. Great. Okay. Um, someone uh, said they have the cookbook and it's beautiful. Uh, what dishes would you recommend for the average home chef to begin their Cajun cooking journey? Great question. I mean, like one of my great things to start with is white beans, you know, they're like absolutely delicious. Um, you can get camilla beans, you can get gordo, rancho gordo beans or whatever. Uh, that's like a meal where you need like three ingredients and you put it in a pot and it's just easy, you know. Uh, me and uh, Chef Kristen Essig uh, talked about this morning, the boiled rice recipe, which is one of those recipes where I um, almost didn't put it in, but I'm like, whatever, MF, you know, Fisher says, you know, like, when is water boiling, you know? So it's like, I'm putting this boiled rice recipe in it because it's a great recipe and your rice stays good for a whole week. It stays fluffy. It doesn't dry out. And Kristen like was like, oh my God, my mind's blown, the boiled rice recipe, you know, and we were cooking these huge meals for uh, hospitals. And she was like, I wish I had that recipe when we were doing that. So uh, white beans and boiled rice, you know, you can't, you can't mess, you can't mess that up. <laughs> That's so funny. Like I would never think of that as a, as a Cajun. I mean, not obviously knowing very much about Cajun food, but I always think of red beans. Yeah, I mean, obviously red beans. We always had red beans, but white beans are, I rather white beans than red beans, so. Yeah, so anyone but Goya, right? Oh yeah, no Goya. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, how, what is the criteria you used for choosing the producers um, and the growers, fishers that you work with? Taste, you know, um, I mean, I'm the person at the farmer's market where the lay person usually is annoyed with me because I'm actually trying things. I'm gonna try all the strawberries before I buy them, you know? Because just because some look perfectly beautiful and red does not mean they taste great, you know? And I'm looking for flavor, you know? And uh, I also sometimes am very aware that it hasn't been raining or it has been raining and shit's not perfect and the strawberries are not gonna be perfect and we're gonna have to make an adjustment there, you know? But um, quality with shrimp, um, there are things that happen where shrimp gets messed up. It comes in uh, to your boat from a net and a lot of times it is dumped in a saltwater tank and that salt immediately starts degrading the meat. And, um, and, you know, it could be the mistake of a deckhand they, to have that salinity perfect. But when you get shrimp that is crappy, then you have, you know, crappy dishes. It's mushy, it falls apart. Um, so flavor, integrity, um, consistency, knowing I can trust the person, um, you know, those things are, you know, super important to me. Yeah. Um, how did your mother help you with the cookbook? My mother was incredible. I can tell you that she cooked so many of the meals that you see. I guess you would say she was a food stylist. Um, you know, I, me and Denny did everything ourselves. We had help from Amanda with um, some prop styling, but it was basically just he and I. I've seen like bigger photo shoots go down for bigger names and bigger books. And there's like 16 people on set. This was not the case for us. And so I enlisted my mother to cook food and bring it to the restaurant. So she would drive up with like the most beautiful food you've ever seen come out of Tupperware. Wow. Um, and then we were able to um, shoot it, you know, like the jambalaya, the white beans, the shrimp spaghetti. My mom had also the perfect shrimp. So a lot of times the shrimp was removed and used again, you know, for another picture, which is crazy. But, you know, it's like she had these perfect tiny shrimp that reminded me of Chauvin and the food she cooked. Um, so she cooked um, so much of the food in the book. We actually had a lot of things that we 
we did when we were spending time at my mom's house, like the black gray dumplings. That day she was just making dumplings for me and Denny and my, and my dad and hers looked so perfect. And ours were like really dark and weren't really what we wanted. And so we just started, you know, shooting all her food that she was just cooking that winds up, you know, in the book. Um, she also, you know, I spent like three months separately um, living there and I woke up every morning and I had a meditation routine for like 45 minutes and I meditated and then I drank coffee and then I worked for eight hours every day in my mother's house so I could really, really immerse myself. And she would come in and tell me it was time for me to quit and like come out and drink coffee and play Scrabble and stuff like that. So she really was like a cheerleader the whole time. And when I actually took the framework, I had the framework written on white sheets of papers and I had them taped all to the wall in the room that I was working in. And when I actually took the framework down to leave to go back to New Orleans, she just started crying. And she was like, I miss those little papers, you know, with all the chapters and everything. And so, um, you know, this book is her book, you know, she's the muse behind it. And she was there for every step of the way. And our greatest compliment we had when we were shooting is she came into the um, restaurant with my nanny and all you when you shooting a book you take all the pictures and you paste them all over the walls and she came in with Denny and I and they both looked at it both these two women from Chauvin you know that speak French that grew up Cajun and they went oh it looks like home mm -hmm. and that was like oh we're we're headed in the right direction Denny you know because you know if you, you know where you want to go but event in the end Denny is shooting a feeling you know, I'm putting out this product, we're putting it in a plate I love, and this is this food I love, but it, you know, he's his own artist and I had to trust him and he had to shoot this feeling. Um, and it's same with the environment, you know, he had to shoot what I felt and what I explained to him, so. Wow. Your, your mom did an amazing job. Yeah, she's incredible, this is like yeah. book. <laughs> <laughs> and um, Denny is unreal. I mean, your book has some of the most beautiful food photographs or any photographs that I, I have ever seen, but especially in a cookbook. I mean, you just open it up and you're like, oh my God, these yeah. photos are unbelievable. So kudos to both of them. Um, so a couple of questions about your restaurant, Mosquito Supper Club. Um, someone asks, does the, someone who's never been asks, like, does the menu change every night seasonally? What are some of the staples this time of year? And then there's a question about like what makes it really special and why you built built it in the first place. So yeah, the menu changes. It kind of depends what we feel like, what dietary restrictions we're dealing with. We had a vegan last night, so that's like a there's nothing vegan in Cajun. There's nothing vegetarian, <laughs> you know. So that's like a whole different thing. But um, y you know, it's like. Right now, we're a lot on autopilot. I can be completely honest with that. There's not a lot of creativity happening. I think we're emotionally drained. But one of those things when we're emotionally drained is we can go to our staples that we know how to execute. And one of those staples that's very important to me is the shrimp okra gumbo. Okra's in season right now, shrimp's in season right now. We get to marry those two things and we serve something that most people have never tasted a gumbo like this. This gumbo's roots are from Africa. We would not have okra if we wouldn't, if Africans wouldn't have brought that um, vegetable over to the States, um, to well, to the nation, however you want to say it. Um, and then, you know, shrimp we have down, of course, in Chauvin. So to marry that perfect brackish shrimp with that okra is, um, is really great. And, and the gumbo we served last night, you know, my sous chef made. And so it's even like her interpretation of carrying that on, you know, it's like, I have my interpretation of my mom. She has my interpretation of mine's. And so, you know, it, it's a group project at the restaurant. I dream of the stuffed crabs that I ate. <laughs> there's like a hundred percent chance you're gonna get crabs at the restaurant you know they're always they're <laughs> always in season i love my purveyor they're one of my favorite purveyors and uh, i just can't take it off the menu it's just one of those things that you're always gonna have crab you're probably always gonna have shrimp um and i just want to add like someone asked what makes it really special and obviously i'm not going to speak from your point of view but from someone from a guest coming to the restaurant First of all, you walk into a home. Like you feel like you're in Melissa's dining room or living room. 
And at brunch, there weren't that many people. So we all sat down around like one long wooden table, you know, which is a really unique experience to be seated with people that you've never met before. And like, I'm from New York and I was sitting with people from other parts of the South and it like felt a little bit awkward at first. And then by the end, like we were just all having this conversation and enjoying this meal together. And like that experience was one of my highlights of like being in New Orleans, like just meeting people and talking to people and like having this community and this shared meal. Like it is such a special experience, like even on top of the incredible food that just feels like it never stops coming out in front of you. Um, so when thank we you. Were, yeah, when we were still doing family style, I referenced this last night, we had 10 people from Bayou Lafouche and at the table were two other people from New York. And at the end of the night, a limo pulled up and all the people from Bayou Lafouche got in it and the two people from New York got in too. And that's what happens on, you know, any given night. I gave strict rules, no, pol no talking about politics you know, no talking about religion, you know, we're here to just like enjoy ourselves. And I remember one time walking through the side dining room and they were having a, you know, a abortion discussion. And I was like, what is happening here? <laughs> refocus group, refocus. Like, I need to have fun. Focus on the crabs. <laughs> but, but, you know, it seems like, it's kind of like you're at a wedding, you know, you get seated, seated by someone you don't know, but eventually, whatever we're all humans and we all get through it. But the food is so much better than any wedding I've ever been to, except for mine. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, someone asked if you have any tips for finding quality seafood in the middle of the country. I don't know if you would know that. Yeah, I do. I'm a huge um, proponent of the internet. You can go to Anna Marie Seafood. Uh, dot com and you can get this some of the same product that I use everything from soft shell shrimp to peeled gumbo shrimp to different sizes of shrimp to fish um, they're an incredible purveyor um, I like there's a couple of different really great people I respect I think one seat a table is one of them there are all these different people um, that you can get seafood delivered straight to your house, put it in your freezer, and then pull it out and use it. Um, I'm one of those people that I don't eat lobster unless I'm on the East Coast in the summer, but right now lobster fishermen need help. Like buy lobsters, buy scallops, buy from whoever you can to eat as much, you know, seafood as you can because you know, Maine is used, used to having 30 million travelers go through it. And obviously that's not gonna happen this summer. And, you know, people are just like dumping fish because they don't know what to do with it. So I, you can find really good quality um, on the internet. Um, well, I don't, if, you don't, if you don't have a fishmonger or a fish butcher shop, you know, if you do, lucky. Here in New Orleans, we don't have one, you know? I mean, you can't, it's very difficult to find fresh seafood in the city. And I'll add, um, if I may, I went to this uh, big sustainable uh, climate, con like it was a huge organizational sort of draw that invited a bunch of chefs for the James Beard Foundation. We went to Princeton, we all sat in different rooms and one of the rooms was um, sustainable fishing. And I learned, even as a chef who's been working in the industry for decades now, that uh, we, there's sort of a stigma on frozen seafood, but actually if you guys can purchase frozen seafood, you're going to be helping a lot of fishermen in this moment. Um, really and sort of even, you know, the master, right. you know, even in here, he's like, sometimes frozen's better. Yeah. You know? So, and I think that that's like something that people need to like understand. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. growing up, we bought 500 pounds of shrimp. We took the heads off and we froze them. You know, so um, that is, you know, how we grew up, so. Yeah. yeah, I just chatted in um, Anna Marie shrimp that you mentioned, and I chatted in Sitka salmon shares that you can get um, like the freshest salmon from Sitka, Alaska delivered to you. I know that they definitely deliver to the middle of the country and it's like incredible. Um, great, well, I think, I think we're, we've done it. We did it. We did it. <laughs> Thanks for everyone who joined. Yeah, yeah, thank you for coming, guys. Thank you so much for every, everyone who came and Lisa, Melissa. This was this was pleasure. wonderful. The pleasure. Um, I will email you all tomorrow with just a little bit of follow up information, and I hope you come back to more MoFad programs soon. Again, find our newsletter. Come come back and stay safe, everyone. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night.
Nice. Thank you, Sari. Thank you, Sari. Thanks, Melissa. Yep.